Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. I'm in the middle of my second week teaching verse by verse through John 14, 15, and 16, and this is what I've entitled Jesus' Farewell Address. He was speaking to His disciples the night that He was going to be arrested and then crucified the very next day. And um, this is actually my footnotes from a digital living commentary, an electronic commentary that I've written, and I've written footnotes on over 27,000 verses in the Bible. This is a verse-by-verse commentary through John 14, 15, and 16. We've taken this and put it in printed form. There's about 150 pages here. And I'm making this available to you. We'll send it to you for nothing, but we do ask you to give something TOWARDS THIS. WE'LL PUT OUT AT LEAST 50,000 OF THESE. IT COULD BE 100,000 OF THESE, AND THERE IS SOME EXPENSE TO IT, SO WE ASK YOU TO DO WHAT YOU CAN TO HELP US. BUT I WANT YOU TO GET THIS. THESE PASSAGES HAVE LITERALLY TRANSFORMED MY LIFE. YOU KNOW, I'VE MENTIONED THIS A NUMBER OF TIMES ALREADY IN THIS SERIES, BUT BY VIRTUE OF THE FACT THAT JESUS WAS SPEAKING TO HIS DISCIPLES THE VERY NIGHT THAT HE WAS GOING TO BE ARRESTED, AND THEN CRUCIFIED. THIS MEANT THAT THEY WERE ENTERING INTO THE GREATEST CRISIS OF THEIR ENTIRE LIFE, AND HE WAS PREPARING THEM. SO THIS IS IMPORTANT. HE WAS SAYING THINGS TO THEM THAT WOULD ALLOW THEM TO MAINTAIN THEIR FAITH THROUGH THE NEXT THREE DAYS WHEN IT LOOKED LIKE EVERYTHING HAD FAILED. AND I PROMISE YOU THAT WHATEVER CRISIS YOU'RE IN, YOU MAY BE GOING THROUGH A DARK PLACE, BUT THESE THINGS THAT JESUS SPOKE TO HIS DISCIPLES 2,000 YEARS AGO, IT'LL WORK FOR YOU TODAY. IT'LL WORK FOR ME. IT HAS WORKED FOR ME. THESE VERSES HAVE BROUGHT ME THROUGH A LOT, AND SO YOU NEED TO REALLY RECEIVE THIS. THIS IS IMPORTANT, AND I ENCOURAGE YOU TO PLEASE GET THESE MATERIALS. YESTERDAY I WAS TALKING ABOUT JESUS SAYING THAT HE WAS GOING TO SEND THEM ANOTHER COMFORTER. LET ME JUST uh, START IN JOHN 14, 16. IT SAYS, AND I WILL PRAY THE FATHER, AND HE SHALL GIVE YOU ANOTHER COMFORTER, THAT HE MAY ABIDE WITH YOU FOREVER. EVEN THE SPIRIT OF TRUTH, WHOM THE WORLD CANNOT RECEIVE, BECAUSE IT SEETH HIM NOT, NEITHER KNOWETH HIM, BUT YOU KNOW HIM, FOR HE DWELLETH WITH YOU AND SHALL BE IN YOU. MAN, THERE ARE A LOT OF THINGS IN this, THESE TWO VERSES. I HAVEN'T GOT TIME TO GO THROUGH EVERYTHING, BUT LET ME JUST POINT OUT, IT SAYS THAT HE MAY ABIDE WITH YOU FOREVER. UNDER THE OLD TESTAMENT, THE HOLY SPIRIT CAME UPON PEOPLE. THERE'S A NUMBER OF REFERENCES TO THE HOLY SPIRIT COMING UPON PEOPLE. THERE'S EVEN A REFERENCE TO THAT THE SPIRIT OF GOD WHICH WAS IN THEM TESTIFIED WHEN THEY WROTE OUT SCRIPTURE AND THEY MADE THESE PROPHECIES. BUT THE HOLY SPIRIT NEVER ABODE WITH THEM FOREVER. THIS IS THE REASON THAT DAVID PRAYED IN PSALMS CHAPTER 51 AFTER HIS SIN WITH Bathsheba AND URIAH. HE SAYS, TAKE NOT YOUR HOLY SPIRIT FROM ME. IT WAS APPROPRIATE FOR DAVID TO PRAY THAT BECAUSE THEY DIDN'T HAVE THE HOLY SPIRIT WITH THEM CONSTANTLY. BUT UNDER THE NEW COVENANT, ONCE YOU RECEIVE THE HOLY SPIRIT, HE WILL NEVER LEAVE YOU OR FORSAKE YOU. HE DWELLS WITH YOU FOREVER. MAN, I COULD JUST EXPOUND ON THAT FOR A NUMBER OF DAYS. BUT IF YOU WOULD JUST SPEND A MOMENT AND STOP AND THINK ABOUT THE FACT THAT, MAN, THAT THE HOLY SPIRIT DWELLS WITH US FOREVER, THAT SHOWS YOU IT HAS TO BE BY GRACE AND MERCY THAT GOD DOES THIS BECAUSE WE DON'T DESERVE ON A CONSISTENT BASIS. THERE'S NOT A ONE OF US THAT DESERVES FOR THE HOLY SPIRIT TO ALWAYS BE WITH US. AND YET, JESUS SAID HE WOULD ABIDE WITH US FOREVER. AND IN THIS NEXT VERSE, IT SAYS THAT THE WORLD CANNOT RECEIVE THE HOLY SPIRIT BECAUSE THEY DON'T SEE HIM. BUT YOU SEE HIM AND HE'S BEEN WITH YOU AND HE SHALL BE IN YOU. WITHOUT ME GOING INTO A LENGTHY THING, I BELIEVE THAT TO BE BORN AGAIN, A PERSON HAS TO HAVE THE HOLY SPIRIT INVOLVED. IT SAYS OVER IN 1 CORINTHIANS CHAPTER 12 THAT WE ARE BAPTIZED BY THE HOLY SPIRIT INTO THE BODY OF CHRIST. SO WHEN YOU GET BORN AGAIN, THE HOLY SPIRIT IS THE ONE THAT DRAWS US TO GOD, CONVICTS US, AND HE IS INVOLVED IN THE BAPTISM OF THE HOLY SPIRIT. BUT THIS SAYS THAT THE HOLY SPIRIT HAS DWELT WITH YOU AND SHALL BE IN YOU. I BELIEVE THAT THERE IS A DIFFERENCE IN THE HOLY SPIRIT BEING INVOLVED IN in SALVATION AND BEING WITH A PERSON WHO'S BORN AGAIN. BUT THEN WHEN YOU RECEIVE THE BAPTISM OF THE HOLY SPIRIT IS WHERE HE COMES AND LIVES IN YOU. NOW, I'M NOT GOING TO MAKE A BIG DEAL OUT OF THIS BECAUSE I HAVE GOOD FRIENDS THAT BELIEVE, NO, WHEN YOU GET SAVED, 
the Holy Spirit comes and lives within you. But then the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a second encounter with the Holy Spirit where all of a sudden this power begins to be manifest. And they're friends of mine. And as far as uh, the end result goes, both of us believe that there is a second encounter with the Holy Spirit beyond just being born again, that there's a second encounter with the Holy Spirit. So as far as practical things go, it's kind of splitting hairs. But because of this verse and some other things, I believe that there is a difference between the Holy Spirit being with you in salvation and then being in you when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But regardless of whether you believe it's just a, re a second encounter, a releasing of the power that you received at salvation, or if you just believe that the Holy Spirit is with you through salvation, but then when you receive the baptism, it's, it's where the Holy Spirit comes within you. Regardless of which way you believe, there is a second encounter with the Lord that is beyond just forgiveness of sins. My personal experience is I got born again when I was eight years old. And I mean, I was made fun of the very next day when I went to school. My friends could tell that there was a difference. And I told them I had been born again, that I had been saved. And I remember being made fun of. They could tell a difference in me at eight years old. So I was saved. But when I was 18 years old, the Holy Spirit came upon me and within me and my life has never been the same. I can guarantee you, you would have never seen me on television if I hadn't had this second encounter with the Holy Spirit, which the Bible calls the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus is referring to here. And even after he was resurrected, the last instruction he gave his disciples in Acts chapter 1, just before he was caught up into heaven, he says, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. And he was talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The fulfillment of that happened in Acts chapter 2 as they were together and they were praying. Suddenly there came cloven tongues of fire upon them and they all spoke with tongues. And these people turned from people who had been afraid and ran and renounced the Lord to people that stood boldly before the scribes and Pharisees, the very people that had killed Jesus. And they testified without fear, so much so that they said, have the, the, they took knowledge of them, said that they had been with Jesus. The baptism of the Holy Spirit changed these people from being weak and timid into bold witnesses. I used to be an introvert, couldn't look at a person in the face, and now I'm talking to millions and billions of people through television, and I speak in large crowds. The Holy Spirit transformed my life. And this isn't just something that's in Scripture. It's not just my testimony. You can go to Charles Finney, talked about having an experience where the waves of liquid love flowed through him, and he talked about the filling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Dwight L. Moody talked about this, and on and on and on. You could go just talking about all of the people that have been used of God. Every one of them emphasized how important the Holy Spirit is. And in the next verse, it says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you talking about through the power of the Holy Spirit, yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but you see me, because I live, ye shall live also. This isn't talking about them seeing him with their physical eyes. This is talking about after the resurrection and the ascension back into heaven, we now know Jesus spirit to spirit, not in the physical. Did you know with my eyes, I have never seen Jesus. I've never heard an audible voice. And yet I have encountered Jesus. I have seen Jesus. I can say that I have seen Jesus, not with my physical eyes. March the 23rd, 1968. It's a long story. I've got this little booklet entitled My, Account, my Appointment with God that'll go into uh, some more explanation. But I was in a prayer meeting and I saw the glory of God, not with my physical eyes, but I saw it with my heart. I got a revelation. I saw the Lord, just like he's saying right here, the world can't receive this because they can't see with their physical eyes. They can't see with their heart. You got to have the eyes of your heart opened up. You got to have your spiritual ears opened up. There's a number of times that Jesus said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Every single person there had ears, physical ears, but they didn't have ears in their heart. 
you've got to open your spiritual eyes. You've got to open up your spiritual ears. God is wanting to speak to every one of us, but it takes the Holy Spirit to allow us to connect with God the Father and with Jesus. And this is what he's talking about right here. And in verse 19, Yet a little while in the world seeth me no more, but you see me, because I live, you shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. You know, that's hard to understand with just your physical brain. I can't understand how it says that Jesus said, I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I'm in you. If you are in me, how can I be in you at the same time? If you fit inside of me, how can I fit inside of you? This doesn't make sense to the natural mind, but I, I don't understand it, but I can embrace it and I can receive it. You know, I don't understand how you can take a little tiny acorn like that and put it in the ground and it turns into this huge oak tree that produces hundreds, thousands of acorns. I don't understand it, but that doesn't keep me from planting it in the ground and taking advantage of it. There's a lot of things I don't understand. I don't understand how a cell phone works. Many of you are watching this program and some of you may be plugged in to a physical cable, but many of you are receiving it through the air. You might be watching it on a cell phone or in some other device and you're seeing things go through the air and, and it's, it's there, but you can't see it. I don't understand all that, but that doesn't keep me from using Wi-Fi and doing things like that. Jesus is just saying that he is in the Father, the Father is in Him, we are in Jesus, and Jesus is in us. I don't understand that completely, but it's just stressing the oneness that through the Spirit we can be united with God so that there literally is no distinction. Matter of fact, it says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, it says, He that is joined unto the Lord is one Spirit. And the word for one there in the Greek is the Greek word hes, H-E-I-S, and it means a singular one to the exclusion of another. It's not talking about we're one in the sense that we have similar purposes, that here's God and here we are down here. No, it means identical. We are one. If there are such things in the spirit realm as being atoms and molecules and stuff, we are atom for atom molecule for molecule, identical to Jesus in the Spirit. We are one. He that's joined unto the Lord is one Spirit, not one body. My body's not physically united with Him. My mental, emotional part, certainly there's times that I'm not thinking and acting like Jesus, but in the Spirit realm, I am one with God. I don't understand that completely, but man, I receive it. And in verse 21, it says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. This goes along with the verse that we read earlier in verse 15, where Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I was talking about that there's lots of people who say, oh yeah, I love God, and yet their lifestyle is against everything that God stands for. Now, I'm not saying that you have to live perfectly and never have any sin, no problem in your life, because none of us can do that. You know, it says over in 1 John, if any man says that he has no sin, he's a liar and the truth isn't in him. You're just deceiving yourself. All of us fail to be the person that we're supposed to be. There's not any of us that are perfect in our actions, but if we truly love Him, we are trying, we are seeking to keep His commandments. And when we fail, man, it grieves us and we don't want to do that again and we turn from it and get back on our faith in the Lord. So there is room for us to be less than we're supposed to be, but if we truly love Him, we are seeking to keep His commandments. And Jesus said right here, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. You can tell whether a person really loves God by their actions. Now, because of this, there are some people that think, well, man, I want to love God, and so what I've got to do is keep all of these commands. Man, I'm asking you to think with me here. This is something that goes right over the head of most people. 
But when you take a statement like this, it says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And so people think, well, man, I want to, I want to love God, and so what I've got to do is keep his commandments. No, what you've got to do is truly love God. And if you love God, then keeping the commandments is a fruit. It's not the root of loving God. It's a fruit. It's a byproduct. It's the result of loving God. And if you don't understand what I'm saying, people get what I call spiritual dyslexia. You know, dyslexia is where a person sees things backwards. Like the word G-O-D to a dyslexic person is D-O-G. There's a big difference between God and dog, but they see things backwards. There's people that see this and think, well, man, to love God, I've got to keep His commandments. No, loving God will cause you to keep His commandments. And you can tell whether you truly love God by how much you are keeping His commandments or desiring to keep His commandments and moving in that direction. I pray that you can see the difference between that. It is not what you do that makes you love God. It's, what you, it's your love for God that makes you do what's right. And again, there's a process. None of us are born again and we are just perfect in all of our actions and we've got our mind totally renewed. It takes a time for us, a process for us to renew our mind and to see the life that God has put on the inside of us manifest itself outside. And so I'm not preaching condemnation to anybody if you aren't doing exactly what you should be. But I am saying that if you truly love God, you should be pressing towards doing what He tells you to do. And yet we've got people today that are standing out. We've got a guy, Raphael Warnock, who uh, is elected to, I believe, the Senate, and he's a Baptist pastor. He pastors the church that... Uh, Martin Luther King used to pastor, and yet he says, based on the Word of God, that Jesus is for abortion. That is perverse. That is contrary to what the Word of God says. And I guarantee you, we've got people that call themselves ministers, and yet they are promoting things, and they aren't just failing to be the person they desire to be, but they don't even desire to live holy. They are desiring evil things. They are killing babies in the name of the Lord. They are promoting homosexuality and transgenderism and adultery and all kinds of lawlessness in the name of the Lord. A person like that, they, it doesn't matter what they say, they are not truly born again. They are not true servants of the Lord. And I know that there's people that'll get on my case and how dare you say that and judge them. I'm not saying anything that the Bible doesn't say. It says here, He that hath my commandments... That's talking about somebody who knows what the Word says, and keepeth them. He it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So really, the whole key is we've just got to focus our attention on God. And if you truly love God more than you love yourself, more than you love the praises of people, and if you put God first in your life, God will reveal himself to you. I've had people come to me before and say, well, I asked God to reveal himself to me and nothing happened. And they just think that, well, he didn't answer my prayers. Let me read this verse to you out of Jeremiah chapter 29. And you know, most people have heard Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. That verse, Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11 says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. And many people have heard that, but then it goes on to say in the next verse, then shall you call upon me and ye shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and ye shall seek me and ye shall find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. The key to that is you have to search with all of your heart. There's some people that say, well, I asked God to reveal himself to me and nothing happened. There's people that'll go in and they'll say, God, I've got five minutes before my favorite show on television comes on, and if you can reveal yourself to me and speak something to me and change my life in five minutes, then have at it. But see, that's not seeking with all of your heart. As long as you can live without God revealing himself to you, then you will. But when you get to a place to where, God, 
I am not moving from here. I'm not doing anything. I want to know your love for me. When you do that, it says that He will manifest Himself unto you. And so I know that I'm speaking to some people right now who you you may be just kind of flirting with things, looking at this Christian television program and thinking, God, have you got anything for me? And you're going to give it just a few minutes here and then you're on to the next thing. I'm telling you in the name of the Lord that that's not the way that God that it works. God doesn't reveal Himself if you are just haphazardly uh, off the hand waiting on God to reveal Himself. You have to seek with all of your heart. And when you get serious, when you put first the kingdom of God, then God will manifest Himself unto you is what Jesus is telling His disciples right here. Boy, this is important. There's some people watching this program right now that you are seeking and saying, God, what do I need to do? God, who are you? How do I know you? I'm speaking to you. The Holy Spirit is sent to reveal Jesus unto you. There are three or four times in these three chapters that Jesus said, He will testify of me. He will take of mine and show it unto you. He will show you things to come. And God wants to reveal Himself to you, but He doesn't want to do it as you're going out the door on your way to go do your own thing. You've got to be literally serious and just get down and, God, reveal yourself to me. God, show me who I am and what you want to do. And when you get to where you're serious and when you seek with all of your heart is when you find. Boy, that is, that is important. In verse 22, it says, Judas said unto him, not Iscariot. This means that there were two of the disciples named Judas. One of them was Judas Iscariot, was his surname, and he's the one that betrayed Jesus. But the other Judas, who was a disciple, said unto him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Let me just summarize this by saying that instead of it coming from the outside, God comes and lives within us through the Holy Spirit, and he gives us revelation knowledge. I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel and the programs that we have available. And I want to encourage you that you can get the materials that we've offered. Also, I'd like to encourage you to like our program and subscribe to what we're doing. We have a lot of material and I believe it'll be a real blessing to you. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you.